no way. No way. If you do that, we're selling. Like she starts going crazy, right? And I'm laughing because I get why she's saying that. Obviously, she has one out of three townhouses. But it's it's such an interesting thing because here the government wants to open it up. Uh, we're all complaining about prices, but nobody wants high density housing. Welcome to the Tom Story Show with Steve Karish and Tom Story, where we discuss everything real estate or whatever else is on our minds. Good to go. All right, let's do it. All right, welcome back to episode. I think we've already lost count now uh, of the Tom Story Show. This is the first one that we have done in person, and to prove to everybody that Steve and I actually are friends, we actually know each other in person, and uh, we've got a guest on today. Sorry, what was your name again? Uh, Richard Robbins. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Rich, Rich. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so to give some background, so. I've known Rich for probably, well, pretty much my entire career, probably nine years. Steve, you've known him a lot longer, 15 years maybe? Oh, geez, man. First event was probably 2010. The first time I met Rich, we actually went uh, crabbing. I crabbing together. In the, like This weather we're experiencing today in Whistler is way better than what we experienced that day. Yeah, you taught me that I don't want to do it again. Yeah, uh, Chris taught me about boating quite a bit. <laughs> quite a bit. He taught me about that. So we are in Whistler because your company, which is Richard Robbins International, which is world-class real estate coaching for North America, but you have a huge membership in Canada. So for people that are watching or listening that don't know who you are yet, what's like the minute of Richard Robbins? Who is Rich? Well... Very quick overview. Started in Peterborough selling real estate, 24 years old, 27, moved to Mark Immuneville, opened a real estate company, yep. uh, got killed for a few years, finally figured it out. Yep. And then in 90, uh, 96, sold that. 98, started Richard Robbins International, which is really, yeah, it's an events coaching company. And your membership now has grown to very large. So we're over 500 coaching members? Yes. Yeah, yeah. we're probably, actually right now we're floating just over six. Wow. So uh, yeah, it's been... Uh, yeah, it's been a great over 20 years, I can say that. That's amazing. Well, not many people can say that they've run a business, you know, started from scratch and been successful for that long. But I think a lot of people watching and listening to this right now, the market is changing. And whether you're a homeowner watching this, a real estate agent, someone in the mortgage industry, you're probably thinking like, oh, this might not go very well. And I don't know exactly when this episode will come out, but when that happens, the next interest rate hike will have happened. I think a lot of people are concerned. And there's a lot of like terrifying headlines out there right now. So as someone that has been through these cycles, advice for homeowners and then realtors for what we're about to go through and the minds that you have to have. Well, for homeowners, it's always the same. You know, people get caught up. Oh, my home's gone down in value. But if you're not selling it, who cares? Right. Right. Um, you only lose or you only win when you sell in all fairness. Sure. Right. And real estate has always been a long-term play and yeah. always should be a long-term play. And I think if people get caught up in trying to, oh, you know, let's flip it. And it, it's very expensive to get in and out of real estate. Yeah. So, you know, long-term, it just doesn't matter, right? And it really doesn't. Um, so I think, you know, people got to realize that. Now, for buyers, you know, maybe there's going to be some opportunity right now, um, which is wonderful because there has, haven't been for buyers for a long time. You know, if you think about what we've gone through over the last, say, two to three years in real estate, it was like something I'd never seen before. Yeah. It was, in, it was insane, right? And not just that, but if you look at the whole economy, you know, I, I tell the story about buying a car, I had to wait seven months to get the car, and then the car arrives, and they want to give me money not to take it, <laughs> because they literally, you know, can probably sell it for more money because it's available right now instead of waiting seven months, you know, like... You know, all these crazy things, and I know supply chain issues got a lot to do with it, but we need things to settle down. Right. Right? It, you know, it just can't continue that way. You know, then you look at realtors, and, uh, of course, if you go back and look at the last two years, like our sales were up, you know, prices in Canada were up 51% in two years. Uh, you know, sales up 36% in two years. So we had an expanding market where all of these opportunities were available. Well, guess what? You know, we're, we're going back to uh, normalizing the market a little yeah. bit. So, you know, it'll all be fine. However, do you need to be a little better 
at what you do? Do you have to think about, you know, how to generate leads? Uh, there's not going to be as much low hanging fruit as there was, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, keep being educated, work on your skill level, right? Start thinking about how you're going to generate leads and, and it'll all be fine. Totally. You know, I had, I had done a talk to realtors at the end of March and it was like the first in-person one I had done in a long time. And I asked, I said, can you put up your hand if you had your best year ever in income or sales in the last two years? And the room, sh- like, obviously everyone put up their hand, yeah. right? And I'm like, what do you think? You think I have a better year this year? And most people kept up their hand. I was like, are you sure? Have you looked at the numbers? Because so those last two years where, and you were showing this morning, we were looking at the chart. So the last 10 years of price growth across Canada and then the last, I think it was the last few years of like five years of sales, right? Yeah. So like 2021 was not normal. No. Like, in fact, it was very unhealthy. Yes. So I think it's just that we've almost become used to the fact that, oh, this is just the norm now. When it never was the norm now, things are changing back to a healthy market. But we think it's going completely the other direction because we're, we've been so far on the other side. And frankly, if you've been a seller in the last two years, you've been spoiled. 100%. Well, I said it this morning, you know, when, when we were in the, uh, at the event, I said, you know, picture yourself driving 120 miles an hour yeah. or 120 kilometers an hour. Yeah. Pick, doesn't matter, right? You're flying along, no traffic, everything's good, right? And you do that for two hours straight. And then all of a sudden you hit traffic and you go down to 60 or 80 kilometers an hour. What's it feel like? Yeah, you feel like you're doing nothing. You feel like you're dead stop, right? <laughs> That's where we and are And guess right what? Now. You're still doing 60 to 80 kilometers an hour. It's just you're not used to that. And we become conditioned to everything over a period of time, right? Yeah. But guess what? Now we're going to become conditioned to something else. And it takes a little while for us to get used to that. Uh, but I, you know, I, I'm not concerned right. about the marketplace. You know, it's, it's just, it's changing. And what is the only constant in the world? Change. Change. So get used to it. We just got to adapt, right? And that's what the great do. So we've got two audiences here for this podcast. One is the consumer, the real estate enthusiast, I call it. The other one is agents. Um, you're the master in Canada about training agents how to do proper business. You're the guy. I'm more interested to hear what you think on the market side of things because I do think here in Canada we are obsessed with this like six to 18 month quick money thing. And I've seen that now since what, late 2014, maybe 2015. There was a period of time, 2017 for you guys, 2019 for us, where that shifted. But it's like the marketplace is addicted to this quick dollar. So do we just stand back and say, I don't know, like get used to normal times again? Or like what the whole society, it's just not a healthy relationship with what the market should really be. I agree. So think about this. People were buying pre-construction, right? And, you know, really over two to three year period, they're making themselves a lot of money. Yeah. Right. And guess what? That's gone away. And when that opportunity was there, it's wonderful to take advantage of that. Why wouldn't you take advantage of that? But I think what we all have to do is realize that there's some basic fundamentals at work in real estate. And the basic fundamentals, and like I've been in real estate in one, you know, almost 40 years, like 37 years I've been in the real estate game, right? And I look at it and I say, the number one thing that I've learned about real estate is that if you play the long game in real estate, you'll look like a hero. Mm -hmm. So... Here's an example. I got a call about, I don't know, two weeks ago from somebody. And uh, it was one of our clients. And they just started asking me about, well, what do you think? Is it a good time? Isn't it a good time? I'm thinking about buying some commercial. And I have this opportunity sitting in front of me. And they said, but, you know, I'm really concerned about the market. I said, so how long do you plan to keep this? This episode of the Tom Story Show is brought to you by the YouTube for Real Estate video course. Are you interested in creating an engaging, value-driven YouTube channel to help educate your client base on real estate in your market, as well as introduce a new revenue stream to your business? Perhaps you've already created a YouTube channel, but are struggling to gain viewership and the subscribers you are looking for. The YouTube for Real Estate course will provide you with proven tips and strategies on how to create and cultivate an engaging YouTube channel, as well as how to optimize your channel, resulting in higher viewership, subscribers, and yes, deals. But that's not it. I implemented YouTube in my business in early 2021, and it has easily been the best marketing source 
for meeting new clients that I have ever had in my business, period. Better than expensive geo farming, internet marketing, and open houses combined. And now it even rivals my repeat and referral business. If you would like to learn all the tips and tricks for meeting new clients using YouTube, simply go to video course login or click the link in the description below and sign up for the YouTube for real estate course today and learn a year's worth of my painstaking research of learning how to use YouTube for real estate in just a few hours by taking the YouTube for real estate course. So go to videocourselogin.com right now and use the promo code TOMSHOW at checkout. Again, that's videocourselogin.com or simply use the link below. I said, I don't know, 20, 25 years? I go, buy it. 25 yeah. years from now, you're going to look like a hero. Mm -hmm. Like you, like people look at you and go, oh boy, aren't you the lucky one? No, no, you're not the lucky one. You know, it's like, it's a real estate, you know, when's the best time to buy it now and wait, buy and wait. Bye. I, ju I just did that in a video because I went back and I, I was pointed in the right direction for Korea's archive stats. And I went back to 1981, the difference between 1981 and 1982. And then it was just like I, I zoomed in on the graph for like the if you bought at the peak of 1981, like disaster, terrible, everything's horrible. And then I zoomed out to 2021. And it's like this little blip, right? And it's just like, yeah, just I, I think hold. I think if you're getting into real estate for the purpose of owning a property for six months, you may as well go to the casino, right? Well, that, that's where I th that's where I think people are at, and I think it's just it's been an unhealthy addiction in maybe our whole economy to it, right? It just doesn't make a ton of sense, and I don't think anybody like us is trying to say that it ever did make sense. But I don't know, maybe the public sees it differently because I mean they don't. The, the overall thought of a real estate agent is not always the most positive one, right? So they're just thinking that we're in it for a fast buck, fastest sale possible, right? And through you and your organization is where I'm, maybe we're, Tom, maybe we're exposed to this differently because we just don't have. And the group we travel in is like doing it the right way. So you kind of forget that the others exist, right? Mm -hmm. Like when I, when I hear some stuff happen, I'm like, there's no way people actually do that or that agent did that. Maybe it does. Maybe we're, we got the wool pulled over our eyes because of the community that you've built. Well, I think, let's face it, you know, that, you know, real estate, the barrier of entry in real estate, as we all know, is a wee bit low. It's better. <laughs> it's better. It's better now than it ever was, I understand, but it's probably a wee bit low. Right. And, you know, if you, when the market was as hot as it was, um, and you're right, it's really been hot for a long time. You know, we're just talking the last couple of years, but really the market's been hot other than blips for quite a while, right? Um, that somebody gets a real estate license is not what they do full time. I always tell this story. I got in an Uber in Vegas one day. I was there for a conference. I'm going to the airport. Guy says to me, what do you do? I said, I'm in the real estate coaching and training business. He said, well, I'm a real estate agent. He's driving my Uber, right? Mm -hmm. And that is somewhat common, right? If you think about it. And when that happens, you get worried because that's also when, like, my aunt's telling me about cryptocurrency. I'm like, oh, there's a bubble. <laughs> right. <laughs> How does she know about this? Well, I, I look at that and I say, well, you know, like, if, if, that, if that person was really great at real estate, they'd be up marketing and prospecting and generating leads and making way more than the 12 bucks or 15 sure. bucks I'm giving them to get to the airport, right? Yeah. But the reason they have a license, chances are, and I can't say this person in particular, is because, you know, maybe their brother will sell or their uncle will sell or whatever the case is, and they get two, three, four deals a year. Well, imagine this. Real estate for almost everybody is the largest transaction, financial transaction they'll ever make. And somebody is doing that, right, that maybe does it once or twice a year. I'm not convinced there's a lot of unethical real estate agent, but I am convinced there's a lot of agents that don't know what they're doing, mm -hmm. right? Now there's, let's face it, there's some unethical, but most people don't know. I was with a buddy of mine and uh, it was down in Florida and we were playing some golf together and he's a very successful agent. And he said to me, and he actually used to work for me years ago when I had my brokerage, so that's long he's been yeah. in real estate. And he said to me, he said, Rich, I actually have to rewrite 50% of the offers that come in. Because he said there's such a disaster. Well, that's a problem. And it really is. So that speaks to your point. It, it, it is a problem. I've actually, I'm starting to give up on this. But as you you do the personality stuff, extremely gold. 
uh, I have received offers in the past where I'm like, oh, I'm just starting from scratch on this one, right? I'm going into web forums and I'm writing it from the beginning because it was so incorrect. And now the offer is actually not signed by the buyer and it's signed by the seller first going back in the other direction, right? It's, it's an issue. I don't know how to, I don't, I don't know how to fix it. Um, Tom knows my theory is, but my come up was through mentorship, right? Tom's come up, I think was also through mentorship, but through your organization more than actual a mentor, but mine was through uh, a mentor. And I'm thinking, why don't we have an apprenticeship program? Why don't we have four years of schooling first? And Tom's got his theories on why that is, and it's, you know, organizations and funding and all these different things. But It's money. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, it's money. Yeah. Like as, as many people paying the fees as possible is, is the best thing. Um, I, I disagree with that. But every other profession, right? Think what it takes for an accountant to get to partner. Think what it takes for a plumber to get his ticket, right? And we just don't have that. And not only that, we get taught the rules of real estate. We don't get taught the game of real estate, right? Like I think, I'm not sure if this was even you that brought it up was, you know, teaching golf, right? Is that is this one of your things where you're like, I'm learning, uh, I'm learning to play golf. And all they did was hand me a rule book and a set of clubs. And once I'm done the rule book, you're a professional golfer. Right. Didn't teach you how to swing the club. And that's what your organization does. Right. Right. Yeah. And that, and you think about it, well, you know, it wasn't that long ago that Tom got licensed, but well, it's crazy now. This is year nine. Is it really? Yeah. Wow, you're really good. I know. Hey, you are. You <laughs> I got right a few grays creeping eyes. in, yeah. But, you know, you, it's so true. You go get a real estate license and they, are they still teaching about meets and bounds probably? Or yeah, whatever I learned about that. Yep. And you're like, yep. what? And I'm going, it, it's like, you'll never use that again nope. in your whole real yeah. estate career. But they, you know, they teach you nothing about exactly how to sell. Funny story. Now, this goes back a long time, but there was a board came to me. And they wanted me to do a presentation. And they wanted to make sure that people could get credits through my presentation, sure. right? And so I had to send in the content. So anyway, I sent in the content. They wouldn't prove it because I was teaching people how to sell and it was too motivational. <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> so they said, we need you to change it. And of course, I said, well, no, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not changing it. Like that. That's what I teach, right? To help people and and. And it's crazy because this is the most valuable investment that people are transacting, yeah. and because you know, we're the, really not trained on the it. regulators teach just that, just the rules and the contract, right? And they teach you nothing about how to deal with the human being that's in front of you, right? Right? They don't how to how to get someone. So tell them it's okay to make a transaction, right? That's what they really want from us. Mm -hmm. They want to know that it's okay to make this decision and that they're not making a stupid decision. And formal organized real estate, I guess they feel that that's teaching people pressure sales, mm -hmm. right? And that's not really, um, not really what it is whatsoever. The, the other question I had for you that can maybe sway this back a little bit again towards the consumer is, as a the not as a as the top real estate coach, you're you're the the professionals in our country likely a lot of them have come through your organization and learned how to do it. How do I now tell an end user or what would you say to a buyer or seller the criteria they should use to pick an agent? So let's not think about your clientele. Let's think about your client's clientele and what should they do when interviewing an agent to find out if that's a good agent? Because that's an extremely hard thing for them to identify, right? It's not the biggest, you know, uh, Instagram account or the Mercedes Benz. Right. Well, it's all based on results, right? So my analogy has always been this. Let's say you had to hire somebody. And the first candidate, they showed up. And maybe they were a marketing specialist for your company, right? And they showed you that, okay, here's my education, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, here's what my, you know, some of my marketing ideas would be and all those sort of things. And you, you look at that content. So in other words, they're talking about what it is they're going to do once you hire them. Um, and then the second candidate comes in and the second candidate does a little bit different. They don't talk about what it is they're going to do. They talk about what they've already done for the companies in the past. So they look at it and they say, okay, I've worked with, you know, this company, that company, this company. Uh, here's some of the ideas we implemented, and here's the results those ideas produced. Which one would you hire? 
that's what I think people aren't good at deciphering. Right. We'd hire the second person yeah, because the they, results. they showed your result. Yeah. They said, Here, here's what I've already done. But right? do you think do you think the public can decipher the difference between this guy's telling me his brag book versus this guy's really selling me the dream of what he's going to do for me. Like there's, those are the two different right. scenarios, right? So then what would you ask a realtor then? So what would you ask a real estate agent if you want to qualify a real estate agent? And again, we obviously talk about this in, in our training, everything. Like I think there's a few things you really need to know about a realtor is number one, you know, how many homes have they actually sold? If you're going to, if you're going to sell your most valuable asset, wouldn't you want to pick somebody that's done it a fair amount of times, mm -hmm. right? So that would probably be a good question right there. How long have you been in the business? Uh, how many homes you actually sold? And then the next question you might want to ask them is, okay, what percentage of your listings, if you're looking to sell your house, actually sell? That'd be a logical question, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you take 100 listings, what percentage of those actually sold? Is it 80%, 60%, 50%, right? And then another logical question might be, well, you know, on average, what percentage of list price are you negotiating for the sellers you work with? Mm -hmm. It would make sense. You want to know yeah. if they have negotiating skills, right? And then the next, on average, how many days is it taking for your listings to sell? Now, there's sort of the four key questions. Because when you ask those questions, now, let's face it, Steve and Tom, you guys know this. If, let's say one seller interviewed 10 agents and asked those 10 agents those questions, how many people do you think could answer those questions? Some wouldn't know what their number, well, most wouldn't know what their numbers were. Maybe eight out of 10 wouldn't know. We wouldn't have a clue, right? Yeah. So you imagine they're sitting there. Now, all of a sudden, the consumer's going, whoa, well, you don't know that, you don't know that, you don't know that, and you don't know that, right? Because that, to me, is what I'd want to know. I'd want to know, you know, what has your success rate in the past been? And so that's, as a consumer, where I would lean, yeah. Okay, so that at least they're, and, and the consumer also then has the opportunity to lead the discussion rather than be led by the discussion. Now, there's a point in time when the real estate agent needs to take charge and lead, but I think if I was interviewing anybody, that's what I'd want to know. So here's another example. I have people phone once in a while. I don't know how they get the number and all that, but, you know, it's, you know, that they get through and they go, oh, you know, so-and-so asked me to call, you know, they're one of the big investment places and they want to know if you want to invest some money. And I always say, well, I really don't know that much about you, but here's what I'd like you to do. I want you to send me the portfolio of this particular person and show me the return they're getting on their money. Sure. And then I'll, I'll let you know. Not one person's ever sent that to me. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause nobody's shown the results. Right. So I found two, um, meeting with sellers. So at the beginning of my career, I had a hard time getting to the kitchen table because I started at 22 years old. That's like I felt like on a client experience level, on an education level, on a service level, I was there, but it was so frustrating because I couldn't get the opportunity. And then one of the things you talk about all the time is experience, right? You know, mm -hmm. the agents have been doing it a long time. They love to tell you they've been doing it a long time. Yeah. I've been in the business for 25 years, but I know there's there's agents in the business for 25 years that I've sold more homes in 10 years than they have in 25 years. So I, I always talk to our clients as well, like experience isn't just time. It's what did you actually accomplish? Yeah. You can do something a long time. It doesn't necessarily mean yeah. that, that you're good at it. And I, I, I kind of talked about this brief, briefly on the other, other episodes, but I had an agent where I was the number six, or sorry, a, a client, I was number six agent that they interviewed. Yeah. First, I was like, well, what was wrong with the other five? <laughs> and, and the reason that what I said to him was like, listen, 90% of everything single sale that I do is repeat and referral someone working with me again or someone sending me their friends. So you're not going to get a sales pitch from me. I did not even bring the paperwork today. I want you to make the right decision. And then next morning he's like, send it over. We're good to go. So I took the opposite approach where I feel like, ha have you noticed a difference from the time where the real estate industry, it started with the book, yeah. right? Or the, the then the hot sheets, yeah. then the MLS, but we had the information. Right. And at this point, the only piece of information I think realtors have that the public doesn't is in the broker remarks it will say when there's an offer date on a property right but now the market's switching where offer dates aren't even happening anymore so over that period of time have you seen that the industry has has changed from being a sales specifically i'm going in to sell this person to i'm going in to tell this person what i would want to know if i was in their position and kind of like the reverse psychology of like i'm not gonna sell you on anything Here's what I want to know, and would you like to work with us? Because I know when you were selling, it was probably a lot different than what you're even teaching now. Is that fair to say? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Oh, it used to be like, you know, if I go back to the, 
you know, especially the 80s, because I started in the 80s, <clears throat> but even, you know, some of the 70s stuff is that it was hardcore, right? Man, it was like you had all these different clothes, right? The takeaway clothes. It was like they used to actually name them all these clothes you're supposed to use. And now, you know, I think people's defenses will go up very, very fast if they feel any form of you trying to influence them into doing something yeah. before they're ready to do it. I think today it's more about education. I think the greatest influence in the world is your ability to educate somebody. Yeah. And the education has to be, you know, more what they, they don't know. It's like the interpretation of everything, right? Like information is everywhere, right. but knowledge is not. So if you can take all the information and turn that into knowledge, you know, I, I know on one of your, Steve, on, on one of your videos, you talked about months of inventory and you actually, you were teaching the consumer about mm -hmm. what it means. That's, I think, what's valuable today in terms of trying to influence somebody because then they get to see that you do know a lot yeah. and they perceive you as an expert. And then you're right. It's like, it's almost better not to close. Yeah. Right. Let me know what you want to do. It's been really, really strange with the, the YouTube side of things which is um, yeah, what do agents think they need to do on video. They think they need to show how fancy the house is and you know show up in a suit and, and show off the house. And that's great to get the listing. Let's face it, listing videos are tools to get listings. They're not tools necessarily to sell listings, mm -hmm. right? For 99% for of the time. There's for, a few small percentage that do them so well, but for, a, but for most of the but time, But I don't yes. think that even when they do them the best... I still don't think that shows a lot of value to the buyers or to the buyers in the active buyers in the marketplace. They may be interested in just looking at it yeah. if they're, you know, maybe the one buyer that does buy it and maybe that's all you're looking for. But we're doing those videos out there to show sellers a beautiful thing about their home, you know, that they love. When we started doing the YouTube stuff, it was all, okay, education. Like I do some boring videos rich like here is a property disclosure statement and how it feels but people are like people watch it oh man i mean they don't get the, the watches that some of the shock value stuff does get but they're like oh that's what that form means now and let me tell you when we're reviewing those uh, or when we're presenting those offers now here's the pds oh yeah i watched a video on that's fine let me read it real quick right and that's i think why they're reaching out is because you're educating them first and that's the uh, specifically on the buy side that is the greatest value i think you can now show as an agent mm -hmm. and the other cool part that i'm finding about it is i again personality type thing i'm not a big fan of repeating myself so it's awesome to see two or three thousand people they're like oh yeah i watched that one it's fine so now it's like oh this is the easiest transaction and there are a bunch of guys that are doing similar types of videos but I don't know that they're showing that they're the expert in their area or why, again, they're, they're starting to talk about the market or why the market might be doing this or why the market might be doing that. And that's the shock value side of it. But it's not like, why should I pick that guy to help me buy a house in that neighborhood? Mm -hmm. And I think that's why Tom and I have well, found so much success in it. You know, and I found with mine too, a lot of the feedback that I get when people call or reach out and say, hey, I've watched the videos, I'd like to work with you. They say, you make it very simple. I can understand what you're talking about. And I think I got that from <laughs> Are you. you very simple, Maybe Tom? I'm very simple. But <laughs> but I got that from where your company is so good at packaging, packaging information that is out there, but then you package it and teach it where you're like, okay, I understand that. And I try to make my videos the same thing. And it's so cool where people will reach out. And it's not like, hey, Tom, I'm interviewing five realtors. Get on the list. It's like, I watch your videos. I want to work with you. Yeah. And it's this totally like mindset shift from they'll even like reference thing I've something I've said in a video or like I don't even remember what I said because we don't have scripts we just talk right mm -hmm. but it's so crazy where that online lead that that we believe in their industry is a you know they're a waste of time whatever but this is a different type mm -hmm. it's like they're an online lead but they're a human being that has like this is Steve's analogy they've been dating you online for six months you just didn't know they existed yeah they've already qualified you yeah right you're they've already made up their mind and that that's the power if you think about you talk about the way it used to be to the way it is now. Right. Like, I'm telling you, like, it's easier now, like, compared to the way it used to be. Because, you know, now you can, like, for instance, like we were talking about this morning at the event, we said, like, everything that's sitting in your head right now as a professional real estate agent is content that you can create. Mm -hmm. 
and push out. Yeah. Yep. Because how is it you can have such a valuable conversation sitting with a buyer or seller? So if you can do it one-on-one, everything sitting in your head is just content. Which now when you push it out, because it's like the old days it was, uh, everybody used to say it was, uh, it was buyer beware, right? Sure. Now it's not. It's not buyer beware anymore. It's like buyers now are, you know, watching everything, listening to everything, reading everything, and then they're deciding, yeah. like, who we're going to go with. And in some cases, by the time they're finished doing their research, they might know as much as many real estate agents know. Not all, but many. So the consumer is so educated today compared to the way they used to be, right? So when you start pushing out content, they start to realize, I didn't know that, I didn't know that, I didn't know that. And every time a consumer thinks himself they didn't know it, they see value in you. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, totally. It, it's so crazy <clears throat> to me how I started making these videos to try and stand out mm-hmm. in a crowded marketplace. I just wanted someone to say like, oh, okay. And especially when you talk about something and like, you know, this as a, as a speaker, like a professional speaker, mm-hmm. you talk about something, you better know what you're saying. You can't go up there and start spewing a bunch of crap that you don't understand. Yeah. Right. And you talk about this, like if you did a talk on something you weren't passionate about, it probably wouldn't come off the same way right. as going and talking about something that you're very passionate about. Yeah. And the, so I want to, I want to shift slightly here. So in my nine years of selling real estate, we had a blip in 2017 where the market cooled off a bit yeah. in 2020 in the condo markets things dropped off and that was the first time i started getting calls saying hey i know you do this you're a specialist in this i could hire my cousin but i need you now Mm -hmm. and this next three four months and we talked about this today is kind of the transition zone yeah where it's like sellers want the old prices buyers aren't willing to pay it no one actually knows what things are worth things are changing all the time if i'm an agent right now worth let's be honest things are slower than they were for everybody Mm mm-hmm uh, maybe a small percentage are still doing the same level of business, but for everybody, it's slowing yeah. down. Yeah. Um, if I'm an agent right now going, okay, there's going to be less oper- – the pie is smaller, but the consumer now needs someone that knows what they're doing. Not every house is going to sell. Right. Not every condo is going to sell. If I'm an agent thinking, okay, well, what can I double down, triple down on in the next six months when everyone else is saying, oh, the market's changing, interest rates are making excuses, how do I grow my business? Well, you look at it and you say – Again, we talked about this morning, but yeah. marketing is the oxygen to their business, right? So, and I think in the last few years, we got a little lazy yeah. as agents. We became almost order takers instead of salespeople because when when sales go up by that much and there's so many opportunities floating around, they're everywhere, yeah. right? They're everywhere. So it's like everything's low-hanging fruit. You're just grabbing it. And all of a sudden now you go, maybe it's not that way anymore. So guess what I got to start to do is I got to get back to some of the basics, and what a great time to become a trusted advisor where people start to look at you and say, you want to know something? You are very good at what yeah. you do. I need you. So that's, I see the opportunity right now is absolutely huge for the top whatever percent. In the last 20, 20. two years, our job was going to a seller <laughs> and saying to that seller, hey, I have 12 offers on your house. Would you like to pick the highest one? It was a very easy conversation. Yeah. Now it's, hey, we had two showings this week. Yeah. Neither of them gave us feedback. This home sold. Eight more have come. They're hard conversations. I think a lot of people haven't had to have those hard conversations in a long time because they're not fun to make. No. And I remember just going back to my small experience of like six months of declining condo prices in 2020 when the pandemic hit. Yeah. Every week, all I did was call people with bad news. Yeah. Hey, this one sold 20 grand lower than the last one. You want to get ahead of it before it keeps going because we cannot guarantee when the bottom of the market's going to happen. Yeah. No one knows. Um, on the interest rate yeah. side of things, how you think this is going to keep going here? Like, are we going to see a drop off? Is because we had talked kind of just like on a car ride when we were going to lunch that one day, mm-hmm. and I had asked you like, well, what was it in the late 80s that really made this happen? And you, it's it's interest rates. Yeah, it's interest rates. Well, actually, you know, based on what I've read or, or learned, I think every real estate recession, sure. if you want to call it that, has been caused by interest rates, right? Because, you know, when you're, when you're buying something worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, a small rate chain makes a difference. Yeah. But I do see rates continuing to go up. I really do. I think until they get this inflation under control, I, 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 like I don't know what else the government can do. They've got to get inflation under control for the long-term yeah. economy for us all. Because... How can you have food prices, gas prices, car prices, and everything else? You know, real estate obviously is one of them. 
like you know it's one thing for the the consumer or i shouldn't say well the consumer yeah. that that does well financially but boy, think about the average family right now like i feel so bad for them i'm thinking all of a sudden now they got to drive to work and their gas has gone up by you know whatever percentage it's crazy you know meat's gone up by whatever percentage you start to look at all that and you got to remember most people in the world they live on fixed incomes so the government has to get that under control because if they don't get that under control right yeah it right. It, it it'd be you know crazy bad ones up happening to us long term right so i think rates will continue to go um, until the government sees that they've, they've got inflation under control. Now, saying that, unfortunately, what we generally see with the government is they go both ways too far. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, 100%, 100%. Right, so they, they, you know, they go down too far, and then they go up too far, and it causes a little bit more damage. So, yeah, I, I, I think rates are going to continue to go up. I really do. And uh, you know, it's, it's going to be difficult for a little while, but... You know, it is what it is, right? Like, I, I look at it and say, we're all going to be fine at the end of the day. And people get so freaked out because they want it to be the way it was. But guess what? Nothing is the way it was. It always changes, right? Do you think there's any truth to the fact that because every news outlet is putting out scary headlines and we are talking about the market changing on a daily basis yeah. and putting out videos about it, that we're almost speaking it more into existence, that we're telling the consumer, hey, things are not good, and then everyone's mind goes, so, okay, things are not good, I'm, I'm going to wait, and we're making the issue worse, or do we think we have, we just don't have that type of control? You know what I mean? Like <laughs> The Tom Story Show is influencing the Canadian real No, but, but a lot of people are saying the same things, and if yeah. I'm someone sitting at home that does not give a crap about real estate other than when I sell my house every 10 years... And I see what's going on. I'm like, that doesn't look very good. Mm-hmm. Of course we do. You think, what is the stock market? Yeah. It's all confidence. Right. Like everything's confidence, right? So, you the, you know, it's like confidence is based on the way somebody feels about a situation. And the minute people start to feel negative about a situation, then what do they do? What's the first thing people do is they close up. They shut down. Yeah. They stop spending money. They quit buying. You know, they, they start saving more. They do all these things they've got to do. And... The minute they start pulling their money out, yeah. right, then that starts to shut down your economy. And that's all we're seeing right now. And you were saying before, so, you know, the average Canadian sitting at home with a fixed income. And, you know, right now the rates are changing on the variable side, but the fix is already up to 5%. Yeah. You know, who knows exactly what's going to happen there. You've gone through recessions over your business and your personal career. Mm-hmm. What, what advice would you give to real estate agent, consumer, anybody mm-hmm. on the next little bit here? Because it's not going to be quite what it was. Mm-hmm. Like, do you have a percentage of money you keep on the side? Is there something that you're doing? Because we had talked when the pandemic first happened, the advice that you gave was with your business. It was like the, the bone, the fat. What was the analogy? Yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. want to cut the fat, but you don't want to cut the bone. Right. Well, I think that's what happens. People started too much. So, and that actually came from Keith Cunningham. Um, he sent out this blog and he said, you know, yes, you want to cut the fat, but you don't want to cut the bone. Right. right? So when I look at, you know, real estate agent, I go, well, what's, you know, they, they don't want to cut their marketing. Mm-hmm. Now that doesn't mean you don't want to try to produce better results with the same dollars. You obviously want to do that, but you sure don't want to, you don't want to cut back on that. And that's what a lot of people do is they cut too far. Right. And also they get themselves in trouble. So, you know, first of all, I think, you know, obviously I'm a little bit older than you guys and I've made a lot of mistakes along the way. And I say to everybody, you know, man, always, 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 always have six months cash available. Now, I'm not saying that maybe you have to have the cash, but have have access to the money. The liquidity of it. Yeah. Yeah. So whether it's a line of credit or whatever the case is, because, you know, if you have six months cash sitting around, like, first of all, nobody's going to go with no money for six months. So six months cash is a lot more than six months cash, right? Yep. So the secret is, is that take the pressure off yourself yeah. so that you can make rational decisions. So many people get in trouble and they start making a rational decision. So what I say is, first thing, marketing, critically important, right? So make sure that you're investing your money in generating leads somehow, some way, whatever that marketing is for you. The second thing I think critically important is some form of of education, whether it be training, whether it be coaching. And the reason why is it's more important now than ever before because now you need that great idea. See, when the market's really good, you can get away without that great idea. And what's interesting is common sense ain't so common. Everybody says to me, well, market starts to change. You guys should be busier than ever. I said, no, 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 no. I said, (laughs) you know, that that, that would make common sense, but it ain't so common, right? But I look at it and say, you need that idea now, right? Because if you're going to start to innovate, start to shift, well, 
where are you going to find that idea sort of thing? So it becomes more important than ever before to make sure that you're educating yourself in terms of changes you can make to produce better results in the world. Um, and the other thing I would say to everybody, I say, relax. Yeah. It's all yeah, going to be okay. Like, you know, I, I go back to the early 90s. The market was crazy. It got, mm -hmm. you know, rates were over 10%. Uh, we were doing buy-down mortgages. You know, we were doing vendor take-backs. We were doing assumption of mortgages, like, that had low rates. Like, it it, it was a whole different world. And you I had did, to learn You didn't that go world. through uh, 80, 81, though, but you did go through the late 80s when you had, or 1990 or whatever it was. Yeah, it started, it started for us about, I remember February of 89 is when I really noticed. It was like somebody shut the tap off. I bought a house in 81. Okay. Okay, my first 17 to three quarters percent was my first mortgage ever. <laughs> that's it, eh? Yeah, that's all. Mm -hmm. It was a cheapie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, you know, we even say that now. People go, what? Yeah. Are you kidding but me? But the house was 90 grand? Yeah, it was 53,500. Okay. <laughs> but here's what was really cool. If we go back then. So I was 21 years old. Yeah. Okay. I was 21 years old. I snow plowed all winter long to save up the deposit for that house using my dad's four-wheel drive. Plus, I had a full-time job well, well, for my real estate days at 24. But the government had, because again, the government will start to do things to stimulate things. Sure. So they're trying to stimulate the real estate market. So they offered you a $3,000 grant that was free, yep. right? And a $5,000 interest-free loan. And the loan didn't have to be paid back until you sold the house. So there was no interest on it. So they gave you eight grand. Plus, I saved, I, I, I think about it now, it's sort of unbelievable, but I saved $10,000. So imagine I had $18,000 put down in a $53,500 know, house, right? What and, was it about you at 21 <laughs> that made you want to buy a house? Because most 21-year-olds aren't thinking, I'm going to work hard for this down payment. They're like living their lives. Yeah, I got married. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what ended up happening was, you know, I thought, I wanted to have a house, right? Yeah. You know, because it's family and... I sort of, you know, started very, very young, and, and yeah, I just, you know, I, 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 w I wanted it. It wasn't an investment then. I wasn't thinking about, oh, I'm going to make money, and this is going to go up in value. That wasn't even, I wasn't even thinking that way, because it wasn't happening right right then. So to me, it was just about a place to and, live. And that's right? a and smarter way to think about it. It needs to be, hey, I look, I get to rent, or I get to buy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, rents go up, mortgages go down. It should be that simple for a lot of people, but mm -hmm. they're caught about, oh, if, is it a good time to buy, bad time to buy? What's it going to do in the next 18 months? Mm -hmm. And it should be, is there a safe place for my kids to go to bed? And can I pay the mortgage? Like, mm -hmm. that's where I think people should be yeah. looking at, right? They And they just focus so much on, you know, ups and downs. And that is just going to stress you out even more. I think there's going to be a bunch of people that are about to be stressed out with their variables. I was talking to my mortgage broker uh, actually on the way up here. Mm -hmm. And he was like, 97% of our mortgages funded this month were variable. Because the gap's so large between variable because and fixed Because the gap right now. was so large. Except now we're going to see, well, af, I don't know what the, the spoiler alert is because this is coming out after the rate announcement, but rate announcement's going up. Like a bunch of people have, have locked into these variable rate mortgages that are not adjustable rate mortgages. And they're possibly, now they're thinking, okay, well, my payment's not going to change, but I'm in a variable. They have no idea what that means. There's a very Just good pay chance more interest. <laughs> they're going to be in a, in a rough spot on mm -hmm. the other side of things, right? Once they're done their first term or if rates just keep going up, which we all expect they will for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be, you know, hey, it's, it's going to be interesting. Let's just say that, right? Do you and, think it's going to be anything like, like everybody compares every time things aren't going up? Like, oh, we're going back to the late 80s. This isn't going to be pretty. What are we going to do here? The only reason I don't think so is yeah. because Canada has, like, I just believe Canada, we've got sort of, you know, fundamentals to have a strong real estate market. Like, you know, based on what you read, right? You go, sure. okay, so you've got all these baby boomers that the price of their house has gone up a lot. They have a lot of wealth in real estate. So what are they doing? They're now starting to transfer that wealth while they're still alive to their kids to get them into the market and help them out. Uh, Benjamin Tall's obviously in the largest wealth transfer in Canadian history, right. right? So, you know, so I think that's got a little bit to do, will we'll save us a little bit. The second is that, you know, it depends what you read, but they say we're, we're short over a million homes in Canada. You know, we have, what, 400,000 people immigrating here every single year. Um, you know, so when you look at some of those things, you think, well, we need housing, right? We need housing. And I think over the last 10 to 15 years, 
it's beginning more difficult to build. Yeah. It's beginning more expensive to build. That in all fairness, a lot of people have just said, forget that. Like, so, you know, they, they sort of moved to the sidelines a little bit. So I, I do think, you know, long term we're fine. I'm not convinced we're going to see like we've seen, you know, in the you know late 80s and early 90s. Um, I'm very hopeful we won't. Yeah. I sure don't want to see that because it was it, it was bad. difficult, right? Yeah, it really was. So we were taking a, a shuttle from the hotel into the village in Whistler yesterday. Oh, this is interesting. And this the, is interesting. And we were saying like, hey, you know, we had three kids with us. Where can we go and get a spot that will take us on a, on a what? And the guy's like, actually, most places don't take reservations. They don't take walk-ins. They're so like, oh, interesting. Why? It's like they're having a massive staffing issue mm -hmm. so steve goes oh is it because the australian visas i made an australian joke right australian uh, visas aren't coming through and the guy was he wasn't having none of that no right? it, he he's was like it's nothing to do with that he basically all. said rental prices are so extreme here yeah. that people cannot if they want to work here but they can't find housing here and uh he gets five applications a day and the first thing they ask is do you have housing and Steve was like, well, if they have housing, do they get a job? He's like, basically. He, yeah, he said he hires once a month. Five applications a day, he hires once a month. And the qualification wow. question is, do you have somewhere to live while you're here? If the answer is yes, job, pick pick the job you want, right? That's how crazy it is here. And that's maybe it's Airbnb. I don't know exactly what it is that, that's been the big effect here. I just can't believe there hasn't been like some sort of company that's been able to come in and solve mm -hmm. that issue, almost like a dormitory style of... Is there uh, rent control in Whistler? I would assume so. I don't know. They're exempt from a lot of our taxes in Whistler, our speculation taxes. Which is interesting because they're the highest value properties I just for the most part. I if you could put... Yeah, they are. Um, I just wonder if you could put together something that was somehow exempt from residential tenancy and it was like labor force living, right? Like 30-day leases or whatever yeah. it is and, and get people in because you could build five, 600 unit condo buildings and hopefully staff this place. Cause it's lit. Like we were walking around last night and it was like, no joke. All the that patios restaurant closed. is closed. That restaurant is uh, closed. Oh yeah. well, and tomorrow they're going to switch. Cause the staff's going to go over there and right. work part time. Oh, it's insane. But I think, you know, we've got to like, at least in my opinion, Canada is a very sought after place yeah. to live. Like it really yeah. is. And you know, and if you look at the U S the U.S. has gone through a lot over the last number of years politically. And I think it's really created some uneasiness with people, right? And all of a sudden, they're looking and saying, well, where's a pretty safe place to be? Well, I think Canada's one of those places right now. And I hope it continues to be, quite honestly. Like, I really do. And I think a lot of people are just going, boy, it's a pretty good place to live, right? And when you, you know, you have 400,000 people that want to live here, but then Think about the students that come mm -hmm. here, visitors that come here. It goes on and on and on. So I think, you know, and again, it's sort of like when the market was really good, you're saying, well, the market was really good. Guess what? A lot of the agents get it. They don't know any different. They, they, they don't know what a bad market looks like. Well, we live in a country that sometimes we get a little jaded too. We yeah. don't realize you know how, good we like have it? how good we have it here, right? You said something to me on the, the MAC retreat that we went to in <clears throat> Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you don't remember this at all, but you said something to me like the difference between here and home is and, and the opportunity that we have is the access to capital. Right. And anybody that knows not just has access to capital that can learn and has the ability to make that capital work for them has greater opportunity than like we were literally sitting in a little I think we were when we were zip lining, mm -hmm. Right. And these guys are working there asses off yeah. for who knows what tips right and you were just like they just don't have the access to the capital to do anything else yeah. they have to save any money if they want to go into a business yeah. venture and you're like that is the opportunity that we have in canada well you think about most third world countries that's a problem yeah right it's not that the people aren't smart you know because you don't even have to be educated to be smart yeah. Right. Like I'm. I'm I've proved a, that. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably all three of us have. But anyway, it's true. But you don't have to be necessarily educated to be smart. But if you look at a third world country, they're like, well, they can't get a mortgage. Yeah. You got to pay cash for a house. So what happens is a really, really small percentage of the people, right, control a huge percentage of the wealth. Mm -hmm. That's what the difference is, right? Mm -hmm. Because this small percentage of people, they own a whole bunch of the houses that everybody will have to go rent because they can never actually own one. And then you think about businesses, the same thing. So that's why. I think we're so blessed here because, you know, really, you know, if, if you just have work ethic, right, you're ambitious, you have some really cool goals, 
you know, even if the banks won't get you, give you the money, there's all kinds of other people that will, that will believe in you, right? Mm-hmm. Like just private money yeah. as an example, right? Where somebody will say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? You know, you got the energy, right? You yeah. got the drive, you know, you got the idea. Okay, well, listen, why don't I be the money guy, right? You can do the sweat equity, sweat equity side of things. And we can be very successful in this world, right? And, uh, and I think, like, just look at the countries. How many can you name that have the opportunities that we do? Are you really thinking about it? Very few. Like, that, that's, few. Like it's, yeah. it's amazing, right? We're, and I think sometimes, you know, we get a little blinded to that because we're in it all day long. And, you know, it's the old saying, it's, a, you know, the, the greatest emotion in the world is gratefulness, right? And I think, mm-hmm. you know, like, grateful for the country we live in, grateful for the business we're in, grateful for the opportunities that we have, right? Uh, and all those sort of things. And, and when you start to, you know, operate from that place all of the time, it's uh, it's amazing what opens up in your world, right? That's going to segue us into something because my, my uncle lived a long time in, in uh, Hong Kong. And he came back and he's like Canadian's favorite pastime. And I'm like thinking, oh, I don't know, hockey, lacrosse, whatever our sports are. And he's like, no, it's complaining, mm-hmm. right? It's complaining. And being uh, around you, I'm you're extremely successful right you're extremely successful and you're also infectiously positive and i just it, that correlation happens so often and i don't know is it like do you think those people that maybe don't have that behind them they can't dig themselves out of it because they're also not around other people because the, the, maybe the media or whoever wants you to believe that people that have money are evil mm-hmm. or or big bad or whatever and that's not my experience every time i meet somebody that's worth more than the last person i met they're only usually harder working and more positive about their work every single day than the guy that's complaining right my my uncle always says he's like you know what they do in hong kong they go to work they put their head down they shut up and they do their work and that's it he's like here we complain when we go to work. We, com- we complain all of the time. We complain about housing. We complain there's not enough taxes spent on us, whatever it is, right? He's like, it is Canada's national pastime. Mm. I mean, I guess I'm just trying to say I'm grateful to be exposed to you, and you actually are the reason Tom and I are friends. And it's, it's so awesome to be brought into a world where the happier the person I'm meeting is usually even the wealthier person I'm meeting, which is crazy to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, thank you for saying all that. That was very nice. Um, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. <laughs> yeah, 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 don't make a habit of that. Okay, I won't recognize you. But anyway, um, yeah, you know, same thing with me. Like, but you know, I I do believe that I had a lot of things happen in my life by chance that connected me with all the right people. I do believe that my journey has been very much by conditioning from the right people. Mm-hmm. Like at 21 years old, I, you know, there's this one guy, Terry Windrum, I've said it before. Uh, I've inter- interviewed him on my podcast and I, you know, he, he was the start of introducing me to all these people that were like, they were crazy successful, like a world I didn't come from, yeah. if you know what I mean. Like yeah. I've always said that it's sort of interesting that, you know, when you get on a plane, they put business class up front and I think it's a good idea because people see it and maybe they aspire to want to be there. You know what I mean? Because if you don't, if you don't see something, Sometimes it's hard to want yeah, it. Yeah, you're not exposed to it. Right, you're not exposed yeah, yeah. to it. So he exposed me to things and people. And and what's really weird is those people are still most of my best friends today. Like mm-hmm. we're, you know, here I'm 61 years old and Terry's now 65 years old. And, we, you know, we still hang out. We still spend time together. And, um, and plus all these people he exposed me. So I do think there is something to be said. And quite honestly, I think, and I, I think both of you guys would agree with this, is that I think a part of what we do as a company is we create a community of like-minded people mm-hmm. where, you know, everybody, they hang out, you know, they get to know each other, right? And, and everybody sort of is like, you know, we're, we're rising together, right? Yeah. We're all having fun and we're doing our best, but we're all rising together. Um, so I do think, you know, conditioning is a big part of success, mm-hmm. right? And all of those people, they you're right, they just seem to be really happy people, kind people, good people, like just want to do a good job for people, all those sort of things. And yeah. yeah. But I do agree with you. I think a lot of people look at it and they go, oh, well, you know, the rich people, you know, they're taking advantage. And I, hey, there's always a few. There's few. In, but I, I look at it overall. I say, no, they work their asses off, man. They, they're really trying to bring value. They're trying to help people. Like, think about it. The only way in the world you can be financially successful is by figuring out how you can serve a whole bunch of people. Mm-hmm. 
and get paid for it. Solve other people's problems. problems. You never have to worry about money. It's it's the only way. Yeah. Like it really, like legally. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you know, we could figure. Hey, it, so. illegally, you might be solving a lot of people's problems. Right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but you just might go to jail for it. But anyway, and uh, and I don't think I would do well in there. That's actually one of my greatest fears. <laughs> it is. It is something that something that scares me to death is thinking about anybody putting me in jail. You you brought up your <laughs> podcast briefly, and uh, I want to give you my thoughts on your podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, because uh, it's probably if you're an agent in Canada, you need to be listening to your podcast as far as I'm concerned. But I want to give you the feedback from it because I listen. To, I'm a podcast guy. I don't listen to music whatsoever. And often there will be two or three or four of your podcasts stack up, right? And I'll be like, I, I don't want you to take offense to this. I'll be like, oh, I just I'm not feeling that today, right? I just <laughs> not. Feel like nah, I'm not going to do it. And then they stack up and they stack up, and I, and I'm like, okay, I've listened to everything else. The only thing left is rich. <laughs> 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 and then I put it on, and God damn it, I feel better after. <laughs> and I think it's awesome. I think it's it's if you're an agent, particularly, I don't think anybody that's uh, if you're still watching this that's in, interested in the um, market is probably not going to listen to your podcast. Right. But if you're an agent in probably the states uh, and as well as Canada, like it's uplifting because like, probably for the stuff that we've we've said but every second or third week i'll be like oh, i don't want to listen to that guy this week i just don't <laughs> want to do it and every time when i actually sit down and do it i i honestly feel better because i i like to hear other people that are going through the same struggles as me every day yeah and it really helps me uh it really helps me get there you've also got structure to it it's been consistent, which I think is awesome. So that's a plug for your podcast. Oh, well, thank you. You sound like my son. I just don't feel like listening to him right now. <laughs> that sounds just like what my son would say, right? <laughs> Come on, Dad. Not now. <laughs> uh, one of my uh, favorite sayings that I hear, I get reminded of it once a year because Keith Roy shares it. He says, everyone believes in affordable housing until it comes time to sell your own property. Yeah. Okay. I'm like, oh, my God. That's like the most true thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Now, through my almost decade of selling no one's ever said like wow prices are so cheap i can't wait to buy a house you know in your 15 years of selling i'm sure the same in the 90s were people complaining about prices yeah so nothing's changed it's always been unaffordable so is there any way to solve this big issue that housing's too expensive or is it just like these are the fundamentals of our market we can like it we can not like it i put out a an instagram uh, reel which was like the market doesn't care what you think yeah it is what it is like we can agree, we can disagree. You can blame realtors for prices going up. Now that prices going are down, somehow it's it's not our fault. You know, like we were yeah. never gonna win, right? Or it's our fault both yeah. ways. So, what do you think? Just like in terms of like prices in Canada, obviously we're gonna have yeah. drop offs, but they seem to go up and down, but then but then up. Yeah, and it's just it's just access to capital, immigration, unemployment. Like, is that? Is that why? Well, I, I think the only solution, yeah. right? If you really want a solution to prices constantly going up or not enough housing, you've, you've got to have more supply. It's the only solution, yeah. the only way. And, and I, I don't think it'll ever happen to the degree we need it to happen. The government has to reduce the cost. they got to reduce all the red tape, and they got to start to open up property yeah. and make it. Here, here's what's really interesting. So Ontario is an example. It's talking about getting rid of a lot of the zoning bylaws. Yeah. You've probably heard this before. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to put a coach house in, you can. If you want to your basement, you can, that sort of thing. And I recently bought a sort of a commercial property, and I was actually joking with the neighbor who I know really well. I knew the neighbor before I bought the yeah. commercial property. And they live there in the residential home. And I just jokingly said to her, I said, uh, oh, she goes, you're going to use it for office? I said, yeah, but I said, I'm going to sever off that parking lot, and I'm putting townhouses back there. She goes, no way. No way. If you do that, we're selling. Like she starts going crazy, right? And I'm laughing because I get why she's saying that, obviously. She has one out of three townhouses. But it's it's such an interesting thing because here the government wants to open it up. Uh, We're all complaining about prices, but nobody wants high-density housing, right? Like you're going, nobody wants, you know. So it's one of those things. It's like, you know, it's sort of like the the yin and yang of it all, right? Right. And the only, like as far as I'm concerned, the absolute only solution is you've got to be able to develop property faster, right? Um, A lot of people say, well, maybe the government's, you know, they have to, you know, create affordable housing. What does that mean? Uh, Well, it means they start to build housing themselves, and then they'll rent it to you or even sell it to you. 
at a much lower price yeah. than what the market value would be based on your financial circumstances, right? Yep. Um, I don't personally don't like that idea sure. at all. Like I'm not I'm not for that idea. I am you know I'm totally for you know let's get some more development happen. Let's make it easier for developers. Let's make it easier for homeowners that maybe if they want to put in an apartment or a coach house or whatever. The, you know I'm all for that. Yeah. I'm going okay. That's really cool, um, and that would help. But guess what? You know the resistance they're going to get from that will be unbelievable just because of the story I just told you about yeah. this neighbor. Oh, I don't want that right. So it's it's. Uh, and not only that, when we have 400,000 people moving here, which I think will continue, uh, we got a country that's financially stable. Our banking system is very, very good. We got a country that, you know, really crime isn't, you know, yep. we have crime, sure, but, but not like a lot of other countries, right? You know, you look at our school system, it's pretty decent. Like we, we literally could go down the list and look at Canada and go, why Canada's great. Yeah. Well, well, that means that we're always going to have a problem because guess what? Everybody wants to, they're, not everybody, but a lot of people say, well, oh, I'd like to be in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that problem is going to go away. I think price will continue to go up. I think people will continue to complain about it, right? Yep. Um, and I think, yeah, I'd like to see more development because maybe that would, you know, just taper it a little bit, right? Uh, and that sort of thing. So, but, Tom, I was listening know. to the Canadian Real Estate Show. Plug them if they're watching back. Uh, one Gerald of the best podcasts. What up? Yep. One of the best podcasts. I don't know who their guest was. I think she was out of Hamilton. But she actually, a uh, point that I had never really considered. And she's like, everybody says, okay, affordable housing, affordable housing. Problem is, you've got two real people that are going to hopefully have some sort of say in that. The real estate industry and government. But they don't have the same definition. The government thinks affordable housing is rentals that they can put people in at a lower than market rate. The real estate industry, sa industry says the young, new, first-time buyer <laughs> that can afford a property. These are not the same definition. So right. we're not even talking about the same. When everybody mentions the same thing, we're not even having the same conversation. Might as well be two different languages. It makes no sense. Well, even mm -hmm. so the first-time home buyers, everything that comes in, it affects the people that are not in the market more than the people that are in the market. Because if you're, if you're not buying and selling, or if you're already in the market, you're riding the wave, good or bad, it is what it is. But first-time home buyer. So let's say in February, I'm a hypothetical first-time home buyer. I want to spend 500 grand to buy a condo in Toronto, which buys you a very small bachelor unit. Okay, so in February the rates were let's say two and let's, let's say three percent fixed. Now they're five, so I now I can afford it even though prices have dropped. I still can't afford it because that lower end of the market saw less decrease than other segments of the market because it's still affordable compared to everything else. Now okay, fine. Now I'll rent. Wait, rental prices are up twenty yeah. percent in the last year because interest rates went up. Less people can afford, and now rental prices go up. And it's like there's no winning. There's no way to win this if you don't have you know, help from family or saved up money, it's really difficult. And I can understand the frustration if you don't have a way in. Like people are like, listen, I don't, I didn't have this advantage. This isn't fair. How the heck am I going to do this? And I don't know what the answer is. My, my thought was um, always, well, we would don't have a housing shortage if interest rates go up, right? Because that's proving to be true in the market. However, again, or what, what argument are we talking about? We, we do all, I've been proven wrong because we do have a housing shortage because rents are skyrocketing. So as soon as people opt out of buying, now rents. Then we have going, a rental shortage. Then we have a rental shortage, right? So we do have a housing shortage. I changed my opinion on that because I was like, just put it at five and a half percent. We're not going to have a housing issue. True on the buying side, probably, or the selling side, or whatever, but not for the people that need or have to rent, right? But don't you think long term, I, I know what you're saying about, okay, then rents go up and you know, we're talking about Whistler, you know, right now, some of the restaurants don't open because they don't have enough staff. But long term, doesn't the free market fix its own problems? I, I guess I don't know because the government interferes so often that I guess we'll never know. Right. At least in, in recent years in Canada, the government has done pretty much everything. The stress test looks like it may have been the best thing they did because we're about to find out if it worked or not because right. everybody after... January 1st, 2018, had to qualify two basis points higher at 5.25, right. which I think will be a good thing for where rates mm -hmm. are going. But And you can go all across Canada, you know, different provinces, what the changes have been. But I guess I maybe the answer is yes, but I don't know because mm -hmm. they, they get into it so often to try to fix the problem. How much of the free market, though, was caused an issue? Like lack of regulation is free market, basically. How much of that caused issue in like 2008? Yeah, I right? agree. So maybe it 
I mean, and I guess then you could argue, well, it would have worked itself out had they had not bailed out everyone in 2008, right? So I guess if you had left it free market and not done the bailouts, maybe you'd be correct. Because mm -hmm. when money was being lent to people that shouldn't have had it, uh, then the whole thing could have crashed and it could have reset, but it was bailed out. Yeah, no, that, you know, you're right. I, I Like, I don't know the answer. I'm, yeah. I'm just saying that I, you know, I look at it and say, you know, would the free market, and you got to remember, when you have a free market, there's going to be a lot of hurt. Yeah. Right? Yep. Like, there's, you know, there's there's going to be a lot of good and there's going to be a lot of hurt. There's big winners and there's big losers. big winners and there's big losers, right? Um, but I, yeah, I don't know the answer either. I, I just have trouble believing that we're going to see house prices in Canada plummet. Yeah. Right? So... If they don't plummet, yeah, I know they go down a little yeah. bit, and then they turn around and they start to go up again. Well, the problem hasn't been solved, like in terms of affordability. Yeah, yeah, you know? you're not going to be buying that single family detached house for forty grand again because the bubble's been going since 1981, right? right. Like it's right. just not going to be there. Yeah. Um, so we've taken up a ton of your time. We appreciate Wait, you being I have here. A question. Okay, I have a question. I have a final question after. Well, I have a question actually. You guys pay me for this? Yeah. What? I, bet. I got you a glass of water out of your yeah. own hotel room. Oh, thank you. It's set. I think us Sue's going to invoice us. Your wife's going to invoice oh, us. Yeah. If we pay, it's another I'll, question. I'll, I'll wait for that check. Yeah. So I, I don't know what Tom's is because we didn't talk about it, but I hope it's not the same. I surprise, wanna... surprise, we didn't come organized to this. <laughs> I want to give you a fictional situation, uh, oh, and then you can tell me who is the better real estate agent in your opinion Okay. okay? For, for the <laughs> consumer to pick. Okay. So let's say you interview two agents and they look like fairly similar plans, fairly similar timeline in, in the business, all that stuff. But your criteria for picking them has to come down to their favorite drink. Right. Okay. One of them you find out drinks, uh, heavily peated scotches. Right. And the other one you find out their favorite drink is grapefruit sour beers. Wow. Now that is your that is your determination. These are the two agents and their qualifications. Who do you pick? <laughs> <laughs> well, I must go with the heavily peated scotches. There we go. Because and, and that is the question. correct. You answer. know that just sounds to me like you know, Rich. We're gonna have you over. I'm gonna get you a nice cold sour beer, and you're gonna enjoy. <laughs> that it. was the correct answer. <laughs> I want you guys to re. I just want everyone here to know that's <laughs> listening. If you're still listening, we're an hour in now. Richard Robbins has officially determined that Steve Karish is a better real estate agent than Tom Story. Okay, what's your question? Okay, Tom? final real question. Nothing to do with real estate. This is just advice for life and, and setting goals and succeeding. So you've talked a lot about how when you were young, you literally wrote down like all the things you wanted to accomplish. And yeah. for the most part, you've crossed a lot of those things off. So advice for people that are feeling, doesn't matter if they're in real estate, whatever, but they're feeling kind of lost. They don't feel like they found themselves yet. Like what advice would you give on a pure like mindset yeah. how do you accomplish what you want in life like how do you make this happen i well i think mindset is everything so the story you're talking about is back when i got really depressed and i woke wind all that and went to see my doctor and i just come off the best year of my life yeah right financially and it was like sometimes you reach this this pinnacle of this goal you set and then you fall you know it's like all of a sudden you go what am i going to do now right and but i didn't realize all this at the time so in that moment, I decide just I'm going to crazy write down all the crazy things I want to do with my life. And I wrote down all these like, you know, 50 things, it was more than 50 things, actually, things I want to do. And some of them were really crazy and some of them, you know, were impossible, all that sort of thing. But it was just fun to look at that. And then literally, I woke up every day and I used to read over the list. And just because I read over the list, I call it future focus, as you know, and I started to focus on what it was that I wanted, what I wanted my life to look like. And I believe from the deepest part of my being is that hope of a better future is the most powerful force in the world. Like if we're hopeful that things, our future can be better than our past, we have something to look forward to. And I always use the analogy, I go like, you know, it's like before you go on a holiday, how do you feel? You're all excited. Yeah, You're all mm -hmm. pumped up. Like sometimes the anticipation of the holiday is better than the bloody holiday, right? You're going, well, how can that be? Because it's mental, mm -hmm. right? Like the whole game we play is mental. Um, so that's the first. I always be, you know, no matter what's going on in the world, always be saying, oh, you know, I want to build this. I want to create this. I want to buy this. I want to do this or whatever. And make your, make your future bigger than your present and bigger than your past. That would be number one. And then the second thing to me is like a little game I play with myself is I wake up every day and I'm a big journaler. I use an app for yeah. it. And I, 
you know, I, I like to write down three things that I'm grateful for, and I can't repeat anything in the same month, which is really hard. Yeah. You get to the 25th, 26th, 27th of the month, like sometimes I'm saying I'm grateful for Steve Koresh. Like that's, you know, it's that's tough. really low. Like, that's I mean, low. I know yeah. it's difficult, right? My wife doesn't even say that. But yeah, <laughs> but, um, but that's, and that's the second thing. And then what I do, and I know this sounds, you know, wooey, but I actually close my eyes and I emotionalize it hmm. because... Listen, when you're grateful, you have nothing but wonderful emotions in your body, right? And so I just close my eyes and I, I think about it. And why am I grateful? How do I feel about that? And then I look the second thing, I close my eyes and I emotionalize it. Because, you know, it, it's really, you know, the, the way you feel is all based on an emotion that you're experiencing. So if I'm experiencing gratefulness, I'm probably feeling pretty good, right? And if I'm feeling pretty good, my energy is probably pretty high. And if my energy is, my energy is pretty high, you know, I can probably go out into the world and, and I, can do, I can do good things, right? And that's, that's just my routine. And I've, you know, it became really like by default because I did it myself. It just became part of what we teach now. And, you know, a part of what we teach. But, yeah. you know, and, you know, I, I believe in it because it worked for me. Well, we want to thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I mean, you know this, but you've been my biggest mentor in the industry, and, and I'm sure for Steve as well, a huge part of the reason that we found success and even have the confidence to, like, do things like this. Because you met me when I first started. I was just, I had no idea what to do. No idea. And I needed guidance. I needed to look up, and I needed to look at first class to be like, wait a second, maybe I could get there one day, right? Like, maybe that's possible. Yeah. Um, if someone's listening and they, and they want more information about your coaching program, where, who do they talk to? Where would they go? Yeah. Just go to richardrobbins.com and, you know, you can talk to, uh, you know, Storm Fletcher or Jamie Ballahood and, yep. and they'd be glad to just have a conversation with you, but just go to the website. Everything's there. All right. Steve, any final thoughts? Um, maybe, just, uh, I mean, I don't like to do sales pitches a ton, but it's, it's been everything for our business. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you guys. You know that. We're a community. I yep. always say that it's, it's the coolest thing in the world that we all get to grow together. Yeah. Right? And that's what's fun because I learned so much from our members. Um, and, you know, then, of course, they get to learn. I get to learn. We all get to learn. And called Learn and Grow. I remember very, very early on someone that was, like, against coaching in general. It was like, all coaching companies are just cults. And I was like, well... If the cult means living a better lifestyle, meeting people I like, and making more money, sign me up. <laughs> exactly. Like, I'm down for that. You can call it whatever you want to call, call it. call it whatever you want. I want to be a part of that. Yeah. So thanks, Rich. We appreciate you having coming on here today. Yeah, thanks, yeah. guys. A lot All of right, fun. Tom. Uh, in front of Rich, I'm going to make you do your signature sign-off. Oh, yeah. Well, it's embarrassing. The, 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 the sour beers didn't, didn't help, but this is how we end everyone. Bye. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate it. <laughs>